You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. I'm channeling my best Katherine Hepburn impression today because of allergies. So excuse any squeaking and cracking that you may hear in my voice. (laughs) Mr. Thomas has heard a number of it (laughs) over the last couple of days. We've actually postponed this recording session by a few days because Kristen got herself out into the pollen. This was in your capacity as a landowner, as they say. Yes. Mowing the lawn. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I was mowing the lawn. I recently bought my first house. And so I was mowing the lawn and cutting back branches. I did some gardening and I spent about four hours outside on Sunday. And I inhaled several gallons of pollen, or at least that's what it felt like. (laughs) And I paid for it all week with watery eyes. And I didn't have a voice for a day. And then I had a voice like this for a day. And now I'm here where I am. Apologies for my voice sounding like, you said Lauren Bacall. I prefer Katherine Hepburn, but it is what it is. Since you're the owner of the voice, we're going with Katherine Hepburn then. I'd call you Kate, but then I'm afraid people are going to get completely confused because we've got episodes currently running with Katherine Kate Miles and her new book Trailed. So we'll stick with Kristen, but I might slip and call you Kate, as in Kate Hepburn, occasionally. La Hepburn would be fine as well, or Kate the Great. And this will head off questions like, what's wrong with Kristen? (laughs) Yeah, what's wrong with Kristen is she's got allergies. And I haven't had an attack this bad in a really long time. But yes, this was pretty awful. I also understand that you followed up your pollen attack with a run Mm -hmm. where you ended up pulling in additional gallons of fresh pollenized. Yeah, I've got a 5K race that I'm training for the Memorial Day weekend. And it's not a good idea to go try to run 5K and then inhale more pollen. And then it's not good. And it's putting a dent in my training schedule too. So I don't know. I can't wave my finger at you because training is important. (laughs) We just have to get you back on the road to recovery. Yeah, this. I don't want to do this again. All right. Good idea. So what are we going to talk about today, Kristen Dilley? Today, we wanted to dive into the world of online sleuthing. And specifically, we want to talk about a subject that you and I as victims advocates have to deal with a lot, increasingly a lot, actually, and that is online tipsters. Because we get a lot of tips in the Colonial Parkway murders. Sometimes we get several a month, and sometimes, I think actually fairly recently, we've been getting like several a week. Yes, this is true. It it feels like it's important to let everybody in on, on our process here of how we deal with tips when they come to us, even though we are not investigators and we have never claimed to be. We do still have to do a certain amount of vetting of the tips that come to us. So we thought it would be a good idea to do a little behind the magic sort of expose here (laughs) to talk about how we deal with all of this and to give some do's and don'ts if you are planning on submitting a tip to law enforcement or anybody about any case that you follow. Now, how many years have you and I been working together on the Colonial Parkway murders? Uh, Since 2015, and I don't remember what year it is right now because it feels like forever. Last time I checked, it's 2022, so we may be coming up on seven years. Seven years, yeah. I guess I've been more heavily involved in the Colonial Parkway murders since 2009, in the fall of 2009, so that's what, 12 years, 12 and a half years. So we've really put ourselves out there in terms of making ourselves available. Of course, we have the podcast over the last two and a half years and the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page coupled with other Colonial Parkway Facebook pages run by Joyce Call Canada, Keith's sister and her family. 
and less active at this point, but still quite active at one time, Colonial Parkway Murders page run by members of the Phelps family. What sort of developed is that people reach out to us, which we find interesting. Kristen, as you said, we're not investigators. We're not trying to position ourselves as investigators. But at the same time, because we've put ourselves out there and there's increasing visibility and interest in these cases, people end up contacting us, as you said, quite frequently. There's been a flurry of activity in the past couple of months. As a matter of fact, I'm still catching up from tips we received from before CrimeCon. Yes. Just working my way backwards through the list with people who have reached out to us. Mostly email, text, Facebook message. We do laugh sometimes because inevitably I'm trying to tell Kristen about a tip we received and I'm like, I hate this multi-platform world. Where Uh is the tip? Because you could probably reach out to us no less than a dozen different ways Mm -hmm. on multiple platforms. And so every once in a while, I'm trying to find the message that a particular individual sent us. I'm like, I want to share this with you, but I can't find it right now. It is, we're almost spoiled for choice, I think, when it comes to ways that people can reach us. Very rarely, I will see a tip before you see it. And then invariably, I'll have to call Bill and say, okay, did you see this tip? And it'll be like, wait, it came in on Messenger. No, it's not. It's on the Parkway page. No, wait, it's Mind Over Murder. And then we have to get ourselves straight. Where did we see it? Who is it from? And then we have to look at, okay, how specific is this tip? Does this sound like it's something that we can immediately pass on to the FBI? Do we need more information? It becomes a whole process. And I don't think that when we started out, certainly when I started with you in 2015, I never in a million years would have thought that one of my almost day-to-day events would be talking about and kind of processing okay, we we got a tip in a murder case. What do we think about this? It it would never have crossed my mind. And yet here we are. And we find ourselves doing this quite a lot, actually. To be clear, I don't want to imply that we're complaining at all. As a matter of fact, we very (laughs) much appreciate people reaching out to us. But we did want to, as Kristen said, peel back the curtain a little bit so you can see what we do with a tip. One of the first things that we do is a big thing with me is I want to know who I'm talking to. People have noticed this a lot. If someone reaches out to me, what I'm looking for is sense of who this is by name. I'm not real big at all on hiding behind online personas and that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. I really don't have time for this. I want to know who I'm talking to. And I have challenged people within the last week I've challenged people because I won't talk to someone until I know who it is I'm talking to. I expect that someone is going to say to me, oh, my avatar, my online name or whatever is XYZ, but my real name is Jane Smith. Right. Then I want to spend a few minutes verifying that there is a Jane Smith at the contact information that you've provided. And I have told people, look, I'm not going to talk to you unless I know who you are, because how do I know you're not somehow involved in the Colonial Parkway murders Mm -hmm. and fishing? And the FBI has told me repeatedly they believe that offenders follow the Colonial Parkway murders on Facebook. They follow Mind Over Murder. They listen to this podcast. They watch interviews that we've done. They've seen the television series, The Lover's Lane Murders. And when the FBI says something like that to me numerous times, I take heed. Now, we have had that interesting conversation more than once where I have asked, have I put myself or my family in danger? Mm -hmm. Long pause. And then (laughs) the agent said, we don't think so. I remember the first time we had that conversation and that sent chills down my spine. At the same time, I'm not going to worry about that stuff. If some nut job is involved in the Colonial Parkway murders and is stupid enough to come after us, me, why not just declare to the world, yep, I'm involved in the Colonial Parkway murders and I showed Mm -hmm. up at Bill Thomas's house. That would be pretty stupid, I would say. So I'm highly confident that won't happen. And I'm certainly not going to spend any time lying awake at night worrying about something like that. I do want to know who it is I'm talking to. Many times when people have reached out to me, I've put them off slightly so I can find a few minutes to do some online research to make certain they are who they say. And you do have a nifty little, you have a nifty little subscription. 
What is it that you use to verify people? Our friends in law enforcement have much more heavy duty ways of looking people up to make sure they are who they say they are. We just use some of the consumer level databases, but you would be amazed people how much information is out there about Mm -hmm. all of us. Oh, and by the way, some of it's wrong because (laughs) I've looked myself up several times and they have people that they say are related to me who are clearly not. They have me living at places I've never lived. They have phone numbers that don't belong to me. I would say the poor information that's available online is accurate, but I would say for me personally, you got to have a 10 or 15% wrong stuff. Now, Thomas, William Thomas is not the most common name ever. It's not John Smith or, you know, Jane Doe or whatever. They do seem to have linked me with a number of Thomases that I don't actually think I'm related to. Mm -hmm. To make things further complicated, by the way, when I was living in Los Angeles, I rented an apartment at a big complex called Park La Brea. I moved in to this apartment after someone had unfortunately been evicted. That individual, whom I never met, had the same last name. (laughs) It created a lot of problems. They had gotten themselves into some financial hot water, and that individual, whose last name is Thomas, his credit rating actually began to get blended with mine. Oh, no. Which was very strange. Oh, no. And then further, when I was in Los Angeles, I actually had my identity stolen as well. Got a hold of, you remember when American Express used to actually send you paper copies of your credit card statement? Yes. Someone got a hold of one of mine and actually stole my identity and sent out Federal Express packages under newly opened Federal Express customers, all under the name William Thomas, charging to my credit card those awful jobs listed on Craigslist where they say at-home check processors and these other really bizarre, crappy jobs. And unfortunately, those jobs are scams. Since these scammers have to work this scam, they find people and pull them in and then they steal someone's identity and send out information to these individuals. So I I was the address and the name and address that they used. So very strange and bizarre situations. We got the most of my credit and background information sorted out, but I'm still shocked the fact that there are people on there that I'm clearly not related to and have never met. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Jeez. So it's not 100% accurate, but you do use it as a way to guarantee that Jane Smith, who has reached out to us about a tip in the Parkway case, is in fact Jane Smith and may actually have some credible evidence. Yeah. And I, I think without exaggeration, I think I've talked to a tipster every single day. This visit. It, it sounds like you've been really busy every time that I've croaked into the phone. <laughs> we, You and I were having the are we going to record a podcast today conversation? <laughs> we, we were, yeah. It, it, it's been an adventure this week, <laughs> for sure. You can, sorry, you can still hear it. You're going to have to edit out some of those cough sounds there, buddy. I'll, I'll do my best. Mr. Thomas is also our resident editor for anybody who does not know that particular <laughs> bit of podcast magic. Uh, and I don't envy him having to listen to this croak. It's all next week. It'll be fine. You're channeling your inner Kate Hepburn the La Hepburn. So I I do want to make sure that as part of our pulling back the curtain expose that we're doing here, that we just give everybody a, a basic idea that there are certain things that law enforcement looks for when it comes to tips. And because law enforcement looks for those things, and because Bill knows that law enforcement looks for those things, we have to look for those things too when they come to us. So whatever form the tip comes in, whether it's it's email or social media or via phone call, there are certain things that we're looking for that we have to pass to law enforcement. And as Bill said, an, an identity that can be actually readily verifiable is one of them. We can never pass on fake names or profile names, or I think you used the term avatar a couple of minutes ago that I like. But we have to make sure that we are passing along information from an actual real source. And we also have to make sure that information in a tip that is specific as opposed to like merely general. And we need to know that the information that we're being given is reliable and and credible. So Bill, when you send tips forward to the FBI, which I know you spend a great deal of time doing, probably more than most people realize, 
what are you looking for in the information that is given that lets you, okay, I can send this to, to law enforcement and they will hopefully take it seriously. Based on my conversations with law enforcement in the Colonial Parkway murders, what they're looking for is specific, clear, actionable intelligence. When I think about it over the years, probably hundreds of people have reached out to us with what they hope is valuable information in the Colonial Parkway murders. But for example, no one should take this to heart. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. When someone reaches out to us and says, oh, I was parking with my girlfriend, boyfriend back in the 80s, a strange man came up to us and interrupted us while we were parking and we were pretty freaked out about it. And we started the car and jammed out of there. Or we looked up and there was a, a peeping Tom looking in the window. I'm really sorry that happened. Yeah. But that isn't something that the FBI or the Virginia State Police can do anything with. If you were to say he was driving a particular kind of car or he was wearing the uniform of a, and again, I'm not picking on anybody, York Pocosin County Sheriff's deputy. That might be something that's specific, that might be of interest to law enforcement, because certainly there's a through line in the Colonial Parkway murders, which is that there's the possibility, right from the beginning of the case, that the offender or offenders might be law enforcement or presenting as such. It could be a wannabe, mm -hmm. a fake cop, that kind of thing. Something with specificity and some clear information that might allow law enforcement to make some inquiries, that might be actionable. That might be something they could do something with. As I said, I'm sorry that this happened and it's scary and creepy and people will often come back to us with things that happened to them during the era of the Colonial Parkway murders, which goes back 35 years now. Unless you've got something that really has that specificity, they're not going to be able to do much with it. Yeah, exactly. I remember when we were talking to Maureen O'Connell, when we were working on Lover's Lane murders, and I said we were getting all of these tips from people about they'd encountered someone on the parkway or someone had encountered them or someone had pursued them in their car. I said, do you want us to try to track these or monitor these or something? And she said, you need as much specific information as possible. And she gave us a list of things. She said, you need a time, you need a date, you need a location. If there's weather conditions, plate numbers, descriptions of cars, descriptions of clothing. She said, anything that you can put together is more helpful than not. I remember thinking, okay, so I pulled together a little, very optimistically pulled together a little form that people could use if they were going to report a tip to us. And I don't think that form ever got used because unfortunately, a lot of what happened on the parkway back then, and we heard from a lot of people, including like colleagues of mine at, at the school where I teach, they were reaching out and going, oh, this weird, creepy thing happened to me on the parkway. Can you do something about it? And a lot of times I, I had to say, I don't think I can because if you can't remember anything more specific than I got chased by a car sometime in the mid 80s, we can't do a lot with it, unfortunately. We're sorry, it's scary, and we're glad that you wanted to tell us about it because it is useful to know that it was happening, but there's not a lot that we can do if it's a very general tip. Now, in some examples, people are coming forward with a great deal of specificity. I find myself, and I, I'm not complaining at all, I'm willing to do this, I find myself trying to research and fill in the gaps about this information that this tipster has provided. Ultimately, what I'm looking to do is send in a document, which in our example usually goes to the FBI. Sometimes they go to the Virginia State Police if it's something that I think is specific to the two incidents in the Colonial Parkway murders that are handled by the Virginia State Police. That is the Robin Edwards, David Nobling murder and the murder of Anna Maria Phelps and Daniel Lauer. If there's something that's specific to those two incidents, which are considered part of the Colonial Parkway murders, I would steer the information to the Virginia State Police offices who are responsible for those cases. In many examples, I'm receiving information or we're receiving information that has to do with the Colonial Parkway murders generally or the Kathy Thomas, Rebecca Dowski murder, the first incident, or the disappearance of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley, the third incident in the series. And both of those cases are handled by the FBI. At the same time, if I receive something that's general to the Colonial Parkway murders, I usually send it to the FBI. 
You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. I end up doing quite a bit of research. If someone gives me names and times and dates and places, I'll try to type that up in a way that makes some sense, I hope, to the investigators. Certainly, I've gotten compliments from the FBI in terms of the tips that we've provided, and Mm -hmm. they do follow up on some of these tips. We've had a frustrating pattern emerge in the last couple of years where the case agent sometimes said, we'll put that in the file, which just grates on me. Mm -hmm. And I know this has happened with some of the other Colonial Parkway murders families. That feels like we're going to stick that in the file and no one's going to follow up on it. I will say there does seem to be some significant forward movement in recent weeks and months, I would say, to follow up on a number of these tips. And our agent has referenced going back and reviewing tips from the last couple of years, specifically looking at that type of information. Usually what I try to do is fill in the blanks as best I can. So, for example, if someone says, and this has happened a lot, people have said, I think my father may be involved in the Colonial Mm -hmm. Parkway murders, my uncle my brother. We've had a lot of that. I'll try to then research who this person is. They're almost always male, where they live, what they did for a living, maybe a history of their addresses, that kind of thing. Obviously the FBI has a lot of this information, but I'm trying to give them what we have and try to make it as specific as possible. Because Kristen, as you said, a general tip about something spooky that happened on the Colonial Parkway murders in the 1980s isn't helpful at all, really. It's just part of a canon of incidents that happened. And our FBI agents have made no bones about the fact that they believe there were police impersonators working or doing something less than positive on the Colonial Parkway murders in the 1980s. Exactly. And we understand that if you are sending forward a tip, we know that it it isn't always possible to be as specific as we might. We understand that. Please don't not send a tip just because you think you don't have enough information. We would rather that you just give us the information that you have and we can continue to ask questions. Bill, I know you spend a significant amount of time on the phone with people just getting more information and asking good questions. And I know that has yielded results. I know that you're very willing to put in the work on that. And one of the things I also want to get clear with people is in addition to finding out who they are, I also want them to be clear on who we are. Sometimes people have reached out to us, and this has happened a lot recently. People aren't really clear on who we are, Kristen Dilley, Bill Thomas. And so I'll explain who we are, that you're not dealing with law enforcement. We're not private investigators. We don't pretend to be investigators. We are a victim's advocate, Kristen Dilley, and the brother of one of the murder victims, at the same time, I don't want people to get freaked out about it. I do say you can be plain spoken with me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm probably not going to dissolve in tears. So if people want to get specific or graphic, even, mm. I don't have a problem with that. Something I referenced a, a moment ago, this is a very interesting development in the last two years, I would say. There's a generational shift now going on. We're starting to receive tips from the sons and daughters, nieces Mm -hmm. and nephews of people who believe their family, father, brother, uncle, grandfather may be involved in the Colonial Parkway murders. So in a number of these examples recently, and this happened extensively in December, January, February, I was talking to young people who in several examples weren't even born when the Colonial Parkway murders happened. These people are now in their early 30s, so they literally weren't even born when Kathy and Becky's murder took place. They have information, and some of it actually was quite significant, I believe, and I've passed this on to the FBI, and they believe their previous generation of relatives are directly involved in the Colonial Parkway murders. And I find it absolutely fascinating that sons and daughters of individuals some of whom are alive, some of whom are dead, some of whom are incarcerated, have come forward to me and said, I believe very specifically in several examples, I believe my father was involved in the Colonial Parkway murders. And here's why. Wow. That's a pretty heavy conversation. And I find it interesting that there are 
so many of them, because clearly we are not a town full of murderers. At least I hope we're not a town full of murderers. That would be terrifying. (laughs) I can think of at least one attempted murderer who lives in Williamsburg. Yes, he was very famously referencing presidential assassin John Hinckley. At least I think that's who you're referencing. Attempted presidential yes. assassin. Yes, attempted presidential assassin John Hinckley. Thankfully, unsuccessful um, assassin John Hinckley. I find it fascinating, and this has happened quite a bit in the last two years, I would say, where we've had these young people, they're younger than I am, that makes them young people, (laughs) they've come forward. And these people actually are quite sincere. They're very apologetic Mm -hmm. about what they think they may have discovered. Some of this stuff is very interesting. I know I'm looking at it from the perspective of the relative of one of the people that was lost. I have to say, when I talk to these young people... They've lost something too. Mm -hmm. And how disturbing it must be. And I do try to put myself in their place. And some of these examples, I've talked to these people multiple times for hours. And you actually get to know them a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is mostly over the phone or Zoom or whatever. I don't have to see them. It's nice, but it's not critical. And you have to take them as they'll come. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, Mm -hmm. I, I do insist I want to know who someone is. And then I think sometimes they're surprised. Usually there's that initial contact. And then as soon as I have an opportunity, I scramble and I want to do some research about who is this person. So by the next time we talk, and I don't play games, but I will work it into conversation that I actually have done a fair amount of research on them. I'll say something about, do you still live in XYZ town or whatever? And and people are always like, oh. And I'm just trying to make it clear that we're going to have a conversation I tend to be very direct. I would hope that they would be as well. As I said, they can say whatever they want. Some people have gotten incredibly graphic in the past Mm -hmm. couple of months about their suspicions of this is specifically one family about their father and potential involvement. And they got extremely graphic. I'm writing all this stuff down going, whoa, if this is real or not. But it's a very interesting dynamic to have a conversation like that. Not something I necessarily expected would develop, as you said. I feel like at this point, there's no way to get around this. So I want to jump into the credibility issue. And uh, Bill and I have discussed how do we deal with this over the last couple of times that we have talked. And I, I don't think there's any better way to deal with it than for me to be the heavy here and just say it. We cannot send anything to law enforcement that starts or ends with psychics. We understand that there are people who feel strongly that they can be very useful in a case like this. It is entirely possible that they can be. We know that Dorothy Allison was consulted originally for the Colonial Parkway case, but we absolutely cannot send a tip that is based on nothing but information from a psychic to law enforcement because there is literally nothing that they can do with that information. There is nothing that they can do with it. And we have had a number of people, including one very recently, who got quite angry that we could do nothing with his information to the extent of spamming our page angrily about it. We cannot send anything that is the result of, I got this from a psychic to law enforcement. They will not take us seriously. No, and this is really important. Understand that we hear from a lot of different people and we try to treat everybody respectfully. And we very much appreciate the fact that they're willing to reach out to us. That said, when I take the time to do extensive research to augment whatever it is they've told us, all the dates, times, places, additional information I can find, in addition to outlining the conversation that took place as we had it. When I turn around and send that information in, mostly to the FBI, our credibility is on the line. And I'm not going to go with some, frankly, nut job idea that makes us look like hysterics. Because when I think about how many tips we've fed the FBI and the Virginia State Police in the 12 years since I've been most heavily involved with this case, it's a lot. Remember, we're not investigators. We can't really evaluate whether something might be significant to our law enforcement partners. They know all kinds of things about these cases and these incidents that we don't know. 
Mm-hmm. So something might jump out to our FBI and Virginia State Police investigators that doesn't mean anything to Kristen or Bill. Because we know a lot, but we don't know everything. Our investigators know a lot, and they don't share everything with us. So, for instance, if someone mentioned a particular piece of evidence or a date or a time or a place or something like that, it might mean something to our agents that doesn't mean anything to us. So we're not going to filter, but at the same time, I'm not going to put my credibility on the line. I don't want them thinking that the Colonial Parkway murders families and the two of us specifically are a bunch of hysterical idiots running around taking every potential tip in the Colonial Parkway murders as gospel. We just can't do that. And I won't because I'm not going to look like an idiot and I'm not going to have the tips that we provide to law enforcement just tossed in a drawer somewhere because, oh, here we go again. And we have no credibility with our friends in law enforcement. That is extremely important to us. And that's why we're so standoffish on the psychic thing. We had a tip a couple of months ago that I actually was potentially quite interesting. It might have tied in a man into other sexual assaults that took place around the same time as the Colonial Parkway murders. This couple that had approached me led with, I'm an intuitive and I see things. And and at the same time, I listened, I was polite and I drew them out. I did end up actually referring them to the FBI and the FBI dealt with them directly. From what I'm hearing recently, it sounds like they were annoyed because they weren't taken that seriously by the FBI agents, which I can't do anything about. I don't work for the FBI and the FBI sure doesn't work for me. Now, they did take the meeting. They did meet with this couple. They did look at some of the things that this couple had. Now, this couple actually had photographs, disturbing photographs, of young women who appeared to be drugged, sleeping, or dead, posed in sexually provocative pictures. Now, they could have been posed. The whole thing could have been fake, but it sure didn't look that way to me. And I did definitely decide with Kristen's input that this is something we should share with the FBI and local law enforcement because it didn't seem to directly tie into the Colonial Parkway murders, although this couple insisted that it did because this guy said he had visions. I actually advised the couple to downplay the visions thing. I'm putting air quotes around that Mm -hmm. because I knew that law enforcement who can be extremely cynical about stuff like that, they weren't going to take them seriously if they led with, I'm an intuitive and I see things and I touched this piece of rope and I saw the Colonial Parkway murders. Quite frankly, it's not good enough. And I have heard from a family member recently that they're annoyed that they weren't taken seriously by the FBI. That's not my problem. I actually provided the introduction. Kristen and I reviewed the information. I did a whole bunch of research, as I always do. I sent it into the FBI. The FBI moved on. It was around Christmas time. Oh, yeah. It was like the week before Christmas, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, they moved like lightning on it. They did. And I really did. I have to thank them for that. This is almost Christmas time. People that work for the federal government, they have a use it or lose it vacation policy. Mm -hmm. And so if they haven't had time to use their vacation time, they can lose it. So a lot of times offices like the FBI towards the end of the year get a little thin because people are taking time to spend with family and use the vacation time they've earned, which they are totally entitled to. I apologized for the timing of it, but I said, I think this might be worth checking out. And boy, they moved on it very quickly. It's not really my problem if ultimately the two tipsters felt that the FBI didn't take them as seriously as they could have. Look, even Kristen and I struggled with the, what do we do with these two who claim he's clairvoyant? And at the same time, they had photographs and at least potential physical evidence that might have tied into some pretty sketchy, scary looking stuff. Even the limited number of photographs I saw were very disturbing, provided my best advice, but ultimately I don't know what they said to the agents. I'm not in the room and it's not like the agents have any obligation to circle back with me and tell me what they thought, although they did actually provide a short version of the fact that they had met with them and they did not think it directly tied into the Colonial Parkway murders. Doesn't mean it didn't tie into sexual assaults or it almost felt it might involve sex trafficking or something like that. These were 
young women that appeared to be as dead, drugged, or maybe playing possum, but it sure didn't look that way to me. Oh, it was very disturbing. One of the best ways, I think, to think about whether or not information that you're going to pass on is going to be valuable to law enforcement, is it something that law enforcement use in court? And you can't prove anything that a psychic has to say. You can't use gossip in court. You can't use hearsay. Anything starting or ending with psychics is not something that is ever going to hold up in court, which is why it is just not something that we can send to our law enforcement partners and say, please take a look at this. This person has said that they have psychic sense, clairvoyance, whatever. The person most recently who sent us a tip even admitted he had zero physical evidence to back up anything that he said. It was clearly a result of his own psychic visions. And he got very upset when we refused to take it to law enforcement. Extremely upset. I feel no need to apologize. No. That. Nope. What nope. in the world did he think we were going to do with this stuff? I'm says he gets visions and says you need to follow up on this. I'm sorry. That's just not good enough. And yeah. I'm not going to look like an idiot in front of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. If I think there's a sliver of a chance that something would be of value to the FBI or the Virginia State Police, we're going to be all over it. But that guy got so mad and it was like, you're not giving us anything that we can take to law enforcement that they can do something with. Your visions may be real to you. And I'm not saying there aren't things in this wonderful world we live in that we cannot explain. I think right. that stuff's fascinating. Right. I like watching uh, Unsolved Mysteries as much as anybody. Do I like a good spooky story? And do I think people can sometimes see things from way into the future or far into the past? Yes. yes. But how is that going to help us move these cases forward? I'm not going to apologize for that funny this guy got all bent out of shape Ooh, i think it was last i think it had to have been just last weekend and i called you at 7 30 and i said this guy is spamming our page over and over he was responding to every single person who commented on any post ever with i know who did it i know who did it i'm you know and then of course you had people who were like oh no wait tell me who and then you had other people who responded and said hey stop that this isn't helping anybody I do want to shout out one of our, I would say one of our champions on the page that day, Mark, who basically took this guy on, said, you're not helping anybody by doing that. And just insisting that from Henrico County is involved. It, it's yeah. meaningless and it's garbage and it's just noise. Yeah. We don't do this very often, but we both looked at each other and said, that's it. He's out of here and we, yeah. we banned him from our pages. Don't waste everybody's time like that. If you've got something, you've got to back it up to some extent. I don't have a problem if someone says, I think my cousin could have been involved in the Colonial Parkway murders based on some things that were said or whatever, but just I'm a psychic and I know it was with nothing to back it up. That gets us nowhere. We've covered two things that are really important when it comes to sending tips forward to us. That is, can you provide specific information and can you provide credible information? One of the things that we would encourage people to do before you send in a tip as well is just to spend a little bit of time doing research on your own before you send forward names. Because we do have, it sounds like I'm being flipped when I call it fan favorites, but we do have fan favorite suspects that tend to come up over and over and over. We have much more to talk about when it comes to online sleuthing and tips on the Colonial Parkway murders and others. So we're going to carry this over into a second episode. Stay tuned next time for another episode of Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.